Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right now the check. The check. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know how to spell it well, I'm sure. <laughs> Hey, good evening, folks, and welcome to the February 13th, 2023 workshop. First up, spring cleanup, Dennis Doitel. <laughs> Doite. Good evening, uh, Mayor, City Councilors. I'm uh, Dennis Doite, Public Works Director, um, here to talk uh, bulky waste for the City of Auburn. Um, we're going to introduce a few uh, changes to our program this year and, and talk through that and answer any questions. Um, First off, our residents care about bulky waste disposal. For that reason, we've been uh, exploring options to make it more accessible um, to our residents. And first up, starting April 1st, 2023, Auburn residents can dispose of household bulky waste year round at mid uh, main waste energy, waste to energy. Um, they're located, and this is at no cost, sorry, to the residents. They're located at 110 uh, Goldwaith Road, uh, just off of Poland Road. Um, their hours are Monday through Friday, seven to 4 p.m. Saturday, 7 a.m. to 12 p.m. We've done this uh, in, in years past, and the same materials um, that everybody has been able to dispose of stay the same. Your furniture, your rugs, your mattresses, metals, propane tanks, all your um, refrigerators, washers, small appliances. Still unacceptable are your paints, oils, any liquid, um, demolition debris, sheetrock, shingles. Those are still not acceptable. Um, Paints, oils, uh, and liquids, hazardous waste can be brought to the Lewiston Depot on River Road. Um, there's a number of events throughout the year that we're a member of that folks uh, will have that um, option as we go through the year. Uh, TVs and monitors can still be brought to um, Public Works Monday through Friday, 7, 7 a.m. to 3.30. We also have the uh, brush uh, pile that is uh, also an option that's 24-7. That's right next to our salt shed. Uh, folks can bring that and that is pretty actively used uh, to this day. So what changed uh, last year or excuse me in previous years we've allowed for two weeks um, for the residents every other year to be able to bring these materials to uh, excuse me main waste to energy. Um, now it's going to be every year or excuse me year round every year going forward is what our hope is. So this will be available again, not just two weeks a year, year round. Folks can go as long as it's during the hours of main waste energy, they can bring those materials there. The biggest change that I think folks will notice is the no biannual curbside bulky waste collection. So uh, typically every two years, you'd see the city get littered with just material all over the streets. That will no longer be the case, but we want folks to, to bring it uh, right to main waste energy and, and have it disposed of right there. Um, we, are, uh, we are looking at options and for legitimate hardship requests can be sent to us. We will work with the residents in those cases that uh, maybe there is a hardship they're, they're challenged with and getting the materials there, we'll work with them and see what we can do to, to help out with that. Um, what we've worked out is, is we are working through a good close monitoring of this. We really, right now, we're not putting any limits. Um, we're allowing folks to bring it there and we're going to track what we're seeing. So we're tracking obviously our bulky waste disposal amounts now. As we open this on April 1st, we'll continue to track that. Our expectation is in the next six months, we'd come back to the City Council with an update and, and be able to explain to you exactly what we're seeing in terms of that data, if we're seeing a huge spike or you know what kind of uh, uh, numbers we're seeing. We have options uh, that we could do a more detailed tracking um, of this uh, through either passes or um, giving you know uh, unique identifying uh, numbers to residents. So mid uh, main waste to energy would be able to track actually individually what the uh, what folks are actually bringing. This is really if we're seeing some abuse being detected, um, maybe somebody is taking it from a commercial standpoint under the guise of this program. We want to make sure that we're tracking that. And that is basically our new program for 2023 and here to answer any questions that uh, you guys have. Thank you for the presentation. With the additional tracking, would that also present an additional cost to that program? So at this point, we don't, that potentially, um, but it, the cost may be as little as us just having to print off or issue um, cards with identify, um, unique identification codes, I guess you could say. Um, we've worked, we're trying to work within Maine Waste Energy system, and so we don't have to go and purchase uh, additional softwares and that, and that's what we're kind of working with now. So 
if there is a cost, as low as possible in terms of just issuing out cards or, or passes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, this this plan is is totally unacceptable. Uh, I think we need to come up with some other. I know that there's been problems with this in the past with bulky waste cleanup on the curbside, um, but it's one of the most popular programs that the city runs. Uh, I think it, we're going to have a riot if 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 we get rid of it. Uh, I think we need to come up with a, a, a better uh, solution for this. I understand that the public works staff doesn't want to do it, but I think that there's going to be um, a, a really big outrage by the public here. I think we need to come up with a better plan. This isn't about the uh, public works employees not wanting to do it. This is about some efficiencies. Uh, we're paying out a considerable amount of money in workers' comp claims. We're paying out uh, a great deal of costs when it comes to this program to try to run it even close to being efficient. Um, and, I, and I think it'll be important to talk with the residents. You know, this is, this is why we're, we're introducing it this year to, to see what the response is. But um, many people don't want to wait for just those, that one day, you know, that one week that they can actually put their, their, uh, their waste up. Because we, we move this through for an entire month. So that means the entire public works crew for an entire month is tied up on this project. Um, but your opportunity to put it out is really limited. So you have to put it out that week that you're, uh, and they put out a schedule that says that week that you're getting your waste, if you are on a Tuesday pickup, you can put it out at this time. But you're really limited on when you can get rid of it. You can always take it to Maine Waste Energy and pay. But what we're saying is we'll waive that. Even with waiving that, the money that we'd be saving through workers' comp, money that we're saving with labor uh, that can be working on other initiatives, I think we're good. Ultimately, this is your decision, Council, but I think um, for efficiencies, this is really what we're, what we're looking at. And we are saying if you have a hardship, a legitimate hardship, you know, my thing is everybody can get whatever it is they're disposing, they got it to themselves, right? They got it to their house at one point or time. Most can probably either ask someone or, or work with somebody to be able to get it back to main waste or get it to main waste energy um, rather than just hauling it out to the to curbside. So, you know, if it'll, it'll be interesting to hear from the other counselors, but we can we can talk about some of our workers comp issues, too, because it's it's considerable. Uh, are we going to allow um, landlords people that own larger buildings that to, to do this at no cost for their tenants and things like that? So la landlords would still need to fall under the their typical program that they have for disposal through the through main waste energy if that's where they bring it. Um, so no, it wouldn't be, you know, allowed for because that would be a commercial use, I think, from a from a commercial hauler standpoint that we'd be the tenants a resident. A tenant tenants would would, would yeah. be absolutely have access to to the to the system. If someone has somebody else, you don't have a pickup truck, mm -hmm. and you have somebody else take your stuff there, would you give, like, how is that going to work? Like, how are we using that to regulate who does it? So they we would, don't know it's half a Lewiston do. Mm -hmm. They would have to give their, that's, that's where, you know, we're going to be tracking this in terms of, you know, if we are seeing abuse. But basically the system works now under their existing system. Resident would come, give their name, and, and their town or you know say the city of Auburn that's where they are they'd have their name in that and that would be how they would verify them at this that's how it's done today um, at this point. so let's say somebody has a uh, they're a tenant mm -hmm. they've got stuff that they need to take somebody has a truck mm -hmm. they just have to go with them correct okay correct. good so if they're not there then it doesn't count correct they'd have to be able to say uh, riding the truck with them over to there and mm -hmm. say ver okay just, right. as long as they can verify that their name and, and town Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I share the good council staples opinion, but I'm not going to word it exactly that way. I understand that public works doesn't, I mean, it's shorthanded, and they have to be pulled off in order to get this stuff done. But if we were going to do this after telling people last year we couldn't do it because it was the off year that we'd be doing it this year and now for now to say you gotta lug it 
I would have preferred you'd say starting next year, the off year, we would start the tracking process and whatnot. Because even though you say it's going to be free, anybody, Auburn resident can take their stuff there. And yes, you'll help do some of the hardships, trying to help get whatever senior or somebody that can't get it. But what I'm afraid of, because we've seen it before in past years, that if we stop spring cleanup, people will start holding all the, hoarding all their crap, either in the cellar, in their attics, or any spare place. And then if there's something that happens in their house and our firemen have to go in for whatever reason, that could hamper their progress to stop a fire or prevent a medical or emergency from being worse. And so it's, it's a double-edged sword because you make it safer for one department and you could cause trouble for another <coughs> as well as for the residents itself. So I'm really not in favor of the plan this year. Uh, the uh, waste management also take TVs, computers, right. and all of that. Right. <coughs> you you uh, identified it as Public Works does it, but both both of you do it. Thank you for that. Yeah. The other thing is, uh, I'm not sure what kind of deal you've worked out with uh, the waste uh, energy at this point, but uh, this like the city of Auburn gets rid of their waste a lot cheaper than what we pay to have it hauled away. So I'm hoping the taxpayer doesn't take it on the backside, uh, you know, that extra $40, $50 that it's going to cost to get rid of it. If it is, I would hope we would see it as a, a little different budget paying them to take care of our trash, which is bulky waste. Thank you. Yeah, listen to some of the counselors. Anybody else have any uh, comments on this, suggestions? The question, what, do we have an estimate of what the savings is going to be? I mean, we, if you'd like to see it, we can go back through and pull. I mean, it, the, the question that you, so this is that, sorry, this is that moving uh, number, right? So if you look at, because some people would say, hey, you're already paying the labor for these people, right? These employees are already paying that labor. But to me, that's labor that's now being expended here it's for the opportunity next four weeks. Cost. So, I mean, if you want to see the full cost, uh, we have we we've, we've done those in the past. We can pull that. Well, I'd be curious to know numbers. what the because I know that there's been injuries in doing this, and there are a lot of them. You know, what is that workman's comp costing us? Yeah. You know, those are real costs. I mean, we've got a a serious budget situation coming this year that we got to look at, and we got to we it, services or raise taxes. Because I think you're going to see you're going to see people you're going to see more bulky waste disposed of, which is a public that's part of that public safety issue that I think Council Gary was talking about. I think you're going to see more bulky waste disposed of because if you take if you were to poll our residents and ask them if the only time they get rid of bulky waste is every two years on spring cleanup, it's not the case. We main waste energy tracks. Auburn residents that go there and pay for that service. That's how we were able to kind of take a look at what some of our numbers look like. So now that's at no cost to that resident when they're taking it. So you have you have residents that probably two or at least minimum two or three times a year will probably go to a main waste of energy and get rid of something. So that's going to be a little added cost for us because that was that was waste that we weren't paying for under this current every two weeks we come and collect it. Uh, plan, but even with some of the numbers that we we had we had looked at, um, when you take a look at our labor, you roll that labor in, because what what we're talking about is if by not doing this we're outsourcing, we're outsourcing work, because now we're going to pay a contractor to do more work for us because our team is doing bulky waste. We ran the numbers on if we had pine tree waste do this, mm -hmm. problem is that cost was just too high for them to go around and do the collection, so that's why we're trying to work this. A little differently so we can run numbers but I can tell you we we would run all the numbers because it's gonna have an impact on what we're outsourcing I mean we're talking about even some ditch work mm -hmm. we're talking about because the team can't do it I'd, I'd be yeah. I'd like to see that yeah. that would be you know, yeah. estimates at, yeah. at least yeah, yeah. Kind of as a roll up I think that was a good point and 
the opportunity costs are important, and also what are we not doing? And I know last year, especially last year, and I have a feeling, please tell us if uh, I'm wrong on this, um, the way the winter has, we're, we're looking at a lot of heaves. We're looking at a lot of potholes. You know, we had how many freeze thaw events last year? We got a bunch this year as well. And driving down the roads, you can already start feeling them starting to buckle. We already have them. Yeah. And I do know last year, our crews were, I mean, we just couldn't get to them in time. Um, and that's without bulky waste. I am concerned if we did have bulky waste, if we wouldn't get to it. We look at a lost cost to a taxpayer, you know, a, it's free to bring your stuff other than your time versus getting new struts and, and rims at $1,000 or whatnot. Um, that might be the, the cost differential. Hard to calculate, but if we could by next meeting, you know, probably have that break, that financial breakdown. Yeah, we have time. I think that, okay. you know, that's why we pushed this off to May. I mean, sorry, April 1st. Uh, so we've got all of March. We'll bring it back. We'll run, run some more numbers for you. Bring that back at the next workshop. Very good. Thank you. I, I remember two years ago the cost to just have it done across the river where we actually put it all, uh, just not your cost to get it there, but the cost for us to pay them was pretty close to 50 grand, one way or the other, up or down. But that was close. You're, you're right. You're very close to it. You're right. Very good. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Appreciate it. We're going to move on. Sale of city, sale of city owned properties, Jay Brunchick. Okay, I wanted to um, take this opportunity to present the idea of selling a few of our city-owned properties. One of them is 121 Mill Street, located in New Auburn. The other one is 80 Lake Street, which is the Lake Street School, which will stop being used as a school at the end of the school year. And then there's a property uh, on Rodman Road. Um, this is the same document you got in your packages, so you get a chance to see is 121 Mill Street. It's four and a half acres. It currently has a 30,000 square foot building on site. And here's, here's the lot right here. Um, what you see here is basically all of this is developable. Um, what isn't so developable is, is this part because it um, gets down into floodplain and is uh, topographically challenging. Um, so that's really it for the presentation on this property. Does anybody have any questions about this property? If I could, I mean, this property has been actually in the news lately because we considered it to be a warming center, yeah. uh, potentially. Uh, there was, after we purchased a building, I believe, or after we purchased, there was significant damage to the building. Could you explain that? Sure. So um, after we purchased the building, there were some pipes that burst and leaked, and we were not aware of it for quite some time. Uh, so it did damage to the rug and, and a portion of the sheetrock. We've taken the rug away and removed the sheetrock about uh, two or three feet up the wall, uh, and we're just leaving it that way for right now. Ceiling, too. Yeah. Ceiling as well? It's all gone. So more than $100,000 in yeah. rehabilitation to bring it up to its current state? I would have to conf yeah, so Glenn knows better because he handled this, but about 100000 Thank you. Needed or spent? Just to get it up to Needed. habitable. Yeah. I'm wondering on this one and also on the Lake Street School one, if we might do a request for proposals. Yes. Just to have control over it versus... Just a straight sale where you're kind of taking a right. shot in the dark. Yeah, so that, and that is, I should have probably explained that. I think on all of these, there'll be RFPs um, so that we can see what, what people 
uh, or what developers or other individuals want to do with the properties. And come back to us. I think right, it's not right. And you're not, um, today is just proposing the idea that we sell it. Uh, you would not be voting on it at this city council. You voted on the next one, whether or not we'll sell the properties, proposing through the RFP process, and then we would go ahead and issue the RFPs. And then you would have to then also approve whoever we accept the RFP, the sale of that property. So we're multiple steps. Well, Councilor, and let's, we'll have the questions down on the specific properties, and then when we're done all three properties, we can have generic questions. But okay. Councilor Gary, you have something on that specific property? Uh, yes, please. I was under the impression, well, I knew about the damage, but I was under the impression that we were working to restore the damage, but you're saying we haven't. We've um, gotten rid of the the, the rug and the sheetrock that were damaged, but because we don't really know what direction we're going with the building, we haven't then there replaced it. And then is it prudent to sell it as one lot or as, or as a divided lot? Because I know we had discussed our use for the building potentially mm -hmm. and possibly of having another senior center built here in Auburn. Yeah, so I, what, what I think would probably make the most sense is as we write the RFP, we can um, explain what some of the city's goals or intentions are or what we're trying to accomplish in the city and then see what we get for proposals back. Some might say, I just want to I, I just want to use a certain portion of the property where the building is. Some might say they want the whole property. So it opens it up for discussion as you go through the RFP process. Has anybody come forward saying, hey, if you guys will sell the property, we're interested? We've had a couple of developers contact us, more wanting to know, you know, is the property going to be up for sale? If it is, um, we're interested in learning more. I think one important thing is three years ago, we couldn't give away. We were giving away property. Mm -hmm. We don't have to give away property anymore. Auburn is an extremely valuable community. People see value in that from all over the country, and they're willing to pay for that value. Hence, the RFP process is critical. Mm -hmm. And we'll get the ideas that we can't think of as a staff or a body mm -hmm. on what could be done, either whole or piecemeal, for any property. You right. know, so, and that's a, the, kind of the nice thing about having people weigh in with ideas. Well, we, we also got a million dollars invested in this piece of property, so mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to give that away. Right. Yeah. I, I would just uh, encourage you guys to put this on Go Auburn. I'm sure you're going to do that anyway. Yes. Yeah. 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 So it'll go out through the typical RFP process, but we'll also, this is a big enough property. We issue a press release, uh, put it on the Go Auburn website. I'll also do some um, email marketing out to like the main um, Realtors and Developers Association, really get the, the word out, uh, as we did with our other city owned properties. And then this one is the Lake Street School. It's 1.88 acres. It's a 14,000 square, 15,000 square foot building on, on the site. Um, we suggest issuing an RFP on this to see what, um, what developers or, or individuals think they could do with the property. Well, and a little heads up on this. When because I'm on the school committee as well. We talked about, um, I brought this up, I asked a question several months ago to the finance committee, which I'm the chair of on the school department, to see if there's a feasibility in maintaining this as a school. They came back with the numbers saying, no, it's not, hence it's back, it will be back in city ownership. Um, over Christmas break, because there's there were no kids there, brought a couple developers over along with city staff, public works to walk through it, to get some ideas of what could happen with that school. Um, and just to brief you in, 10 to 12, mar uh, 10 to 12 apartments ish from a size standpoint. It's peculiar unless you've been in there, you think it's two full floors. In actuality, it's not. It's a half below grade basement and then a regular first floor. Uh, decent condition, though it's probably could be a historic building, which means you could sell the tax credits, making redevelopment feasible, very feasible. So. Um, and it's a big lot, very, very big lot. So there's some interest enough, and we kind of wanted to look and poke that around a little bit to see if 
you know, what kind of options might be out there. So I'm glad to see that's on an RFP list. Yeah. Aren't um, 7 and 9 Fern Street city-owned properties as well? Maybe we should put that. Uh, I don't know if it would be in the same uh, listing, but it, we could we could put them next to each other as an advertisement. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, and then this this is a uh, unique little parcel. It's on the corner of Manley and Rodman. It doesn't have an address because I believe there never was a building on the site. The city owns it, and we do have a uh, uh, an easement. Or we would want to maintain an easement for some stormwater uh, a culvert. But other than that, it's a property the city's just not using. So it would be great to put it out RFP, and uh, it is buildable. Uh, just to see what what we get for input back. Thanks, Jay. Yep. A question on that? Can you uh, say where AVCOG is in relation to that? Because I'm having trouble yeah, sort of uh, figuring which corner. Yeah. So it's further for the back. Yeah. I'm, I'm not on GIS right now, so I can't necessarily. Oh, right. Right. Yep. Used to be a house there. I, I can get over Persky right. lived there. It's gonna flip it the way that you would think it would look like. Just twist it. No, it's, it's on the Rodman side. Rodman and Manley. It's at the intersection. Um, so if I, <coughs> while we're looking at that, uh, I, Jay said something about the RFP. I think it's important that we look at and some of these properties are pretty clear cut like rodman road uh, that at that lot commercial maybe owner occupied but in our rfp process we should have some stated goals and almost a priority list if you would of what the city kind of wants to see um happen on some of these these properties okay again rodman road that very well could be in the zoning there it could be two house lots facing facing either or it could be commercial whatnot but we have goals, and we've been talking a lot as a council about residential. That's great. Okay. We'd like to see residential. But what kind of residential? And just, you know, as an example, I've heard you all talk a lot about owner-occupied residential, market rate versus subsidized. Um, does that be a biz commercial versus non-commercial? Obviously, if it's zone commercial, it's going to be commercial. So is there any thoughts on that? And I have one thought I'd like to interject just to help you think about it, but we should come to some sort of consensus. Uh, so Jay has some direction, but childcare. We know we have a childcare crisis in the state. We have a workforce crisis. We have a housing crisis. We got a lot of crises. Um, but looking at childcare, looking at some of the state initiatives and looking at some of these parcels, for example, you know, I'm not sure if Mill Street makes sense, but Lake Street School would make sense conceptually if we sold it to or leased it what have you to um, a long-term child I mean, theoretically 80 doing some math 80 to 100 kids could be in that school again that's 80 to 100 people that are back into the workforce it's not taking away from any other type of child care facility because there's waiting lists a mile long it would be additive and I'm not saying that's what it should be but if we put something in the RFP saying these are some of the ideas in which we'd entertain you know, we might get back something we're not expecting and make a thoughtful decision, not just based upon an initial return on investment. We know we need housing. 12 units might be great. It is great. Everything's, you know, needed. <coughs> but we might get a better return on investment as a community if it was child care. So something to think about. I don't know. I'll, I'll lead it off with that, if that makes sense. But I'd like to hear some thoughts. I think Jay would, too, so he can start crafting the RFPs. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like for the Lake Street School more something that keeps in character with the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We've already had an upheaval about different zonings all around and in there. And the response was they did not want the character what they've, cho what they've grown to love to be damaged. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see something that fits that character. Well, I could understand the daycare, but I could also see, I, even though you say we don't need any more subsidized housing, 
I think. Okay. I'd like to see some a little bit more subsidized housing because people s still can't afford these market rate rents at a hundred. Excuse me, twelve hundred, fourteen hundred a month. Mm -hmm. So what we could do when when we write up the RFP is make sure that we've got the zoning um, listed off of what you can and can't do in that zoning, so that we're not getting proposals for some type of business or something that can't happen in that area. Um, I'll have to work with planning and permitting uh, with Eric Cousins to make sure we've got it written up appropriately, but my thought is where it's already a school, um, the, probably building-wise there might be some different requirements when it's daycare, but essentially it would fall under a similar category as school. So we could make sure that we're um, tightening up and making sure we're not getting proposals that that won't match the neighborhood. And we're always going to have the final say on all RFP requests. Right. Correct. Okay. So that would address, you know, instead of you know, saying what you want or being very prescriptive up front, we'll all have the council. You'll have the final say on how you dispose of the property based upon the RFP request. One of the one of the things that uh, when we brought in some experienced developers just to get input as to what could happen with this building. The thing that came up was at least on the exterior of the building, you would probably want to uh, take advantage of historic tax credits. And if that's the case, then the outside of the building needs to remain the same, uh, as well as when it comes to the Lake Street side of the school where the front facade is, you wouldn't be able to build or put something that would block the view of the building. So I think between our zoning and then the type of building it is and the way most developers would approach um, renovating that building, that we're, we're most likely going to get a lot of proposals that are within uh, our zoning and, and within what the neighborhood would want to see. Jay will, Jay will include it in the RFP, but the thing to keep in mind, too, is this area right, oh, this mouse is difficult, right in here. Uh, that's where the there's a, like a playground that's there. So that's land and water conservation. That will have to remain, uh, but that's something we could work with a developer. I think it would be nice to enhance that mm -hmm. uh, with a developer or whoever's going to be going in there. So it has a better uh, neighborhood access, um, better use. Uh, but we that much like what Jay was saying on the Rodman Road, where there was an easement because of stormwater. This one will also have some restrictions because of the land water conservation uh, requirement that we have to maintain that as a uh, public recreation use. So to build off that, my concern with a daycare is, yes, we might be utilizing that, that building for a business, but at the same time, you do have children in that neighborhood that need a place to play. My kids personally, I know we walk that street every single day, and the kids like playing out there and they run around and it's a safe spot. Plus, every time you walk by, there's kids playing basketball and what have you. If you bring a daycare into a, in a, or a facility like that there, most of the time, if they build a, a playground or what have you, no outside people are allowed in because of liability. So again, we've lost that recreational ability right there on Lake Street, which has been there forever. So that's my biggest concern. Yeah, so regardless of what goes in, you won't, we won't lose that because that has to be... You won't lose it on this area. Right. Yep. But, but as I'm long as it certain. stays open. Yeah. That's Maybe my main enhanced, concern. Enhanced recreation. Yeah. Yeah. Currently, there's a jungle gym or something. I, I think it's there. Yeah, it's a death trap it, for it real. Could, <laughs> right. It, it could change to something else recreational. Just looking at the site and thinking about, the, you know, the potential for it, I think, you know, the building itself lends itself to historic tax credits. You possibly could do co-ops, mm -hmm. co-op units, which they're doing in Lewiston. We haven't seen it much in Auburn, but certainly works in Lewiston. Uh, and those two other parcels uh, could be daycare. And the daycare could take advantage of the play area right next door, the playground, and covenant that the playground shall remain as a public playground. Uh, you could idea. kill a bunch of birds with one stone, I think, with that site. It's a beautiful site. And maybe in the RFP, you could say we're would look at ideas for enhancing that, mm -hmm. you know, upgrading and putting in improved and new, you know, mm -hmm. playground stuff. Sure. Okay. 
I, I recognize we're probably going to have the opportunity to look at anything that comes forward on some of these, but uh, what I would look for is either something that there's a big need for. I mean, child care is great. Uh, housing is great. Uh, if it's something bes besides those things, I think it would be great to see something that maybe we don't have in the city. So a new addition, a new service, something interesting that we could look forward to using. Thank you. Okay. You got enough direction? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Next, we have Glenn Holmes, Director of Business Community Development. He's going to talk about our home consortium and uh, CDBG. Mayor, you have uh, Eric next. Do I? You sure? Okay. We'll take Eric next. Oh, she, cousins, yeah. Well, I know, you're going on, I know you're going on vacation in a couple days, so I kind of already just forgot about you. <laughs> Eric Cousins is here to talk about the proposed amendment to the ordinances related to public safety, detention, and correctional facilities. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Um, this discussion started uh, almost a year ago um, when the Council passed a moratorium related to um, government uses, public safety facilities, after realizing that we really didn't have an ordinance that addressed the differences between different types of government uses. Um, we had government offices, municipal uses listed, but that could really run the gamut um, of uses that could be uh, performed by the government. So it could include uh, jails, um, new fire stations, new police stations, um, long-term uh, correctional facilities. It can, could include, arguably, all of those things. Um, so we've been working since uh, with the planning board to better define those different types of government uses that are allowed within different zoning districts within the city. Um, city of Augusta, not surprisingly, uh, being the state's capital, had really well defined uh, different types of government uses that we used as a model um, for a lot of the work that we did with the planning board in, in just differentiating those different types of uses and talking about the uh, different impacts that a neighbor might uh, experience from the different types of uses. Um, we worked through that with the planning board, uh, came up with a list of definitions that we think is pretty holistic, um, but still separates the different types of uses based on um, their use type and the impacts that, that you'd expect from them. Um, we then worked with the planning board through sort of a matrix um, of different zoning districts and where we allowed government uses already and um, modified our permitted and special exception use list in almost every zoning district um, to allow for um, the use type um, that was deemed appropriate in that zone. Um, it would open up the actual packet for the test. Yeah, it will. Okay. Yep. So in, in your packet, um, you'll see the matrix that we used to start that discussion. Um, you will see, I'll scroll down to it, I think it's the first piece. Um, so this was really a draft that we've used with the planning board um, to talk about which zones each of the different types of uses could be allowed in. Um, once we worked through that with the planning board, we took those um, zoning districts, um, and S means uh, special exception, X means it's not allowed in that zoning district, and P means it's a permitted use in that zoning district. We took that discussion and then um, created a new definition for each use type that was seen as necessary to distinguish between other use types. I'll show you here in a, in a second. That draft is um, included in your packet, and any new definitions are shown in red um, underlined text any deletions are shown um, with overstrikes through it. We didn't have many deletions. In this case, we were really adding uh, new definition types and then choosing which zones they would be allowed in. Um, I would say the most limited use that we talked about is um, longer-term correctional facilities and jails. Um, this draft ordinance, as you get into the use types, proposes that those are only allowed in the T-5-2 district where we already have um, the facility that's run by the county across the street um, and the industrial zoning district, but they're not proposed to be allowed in the more visible sort of commercial corridors um, and certainly not in residential districts and not in the agricultural zone either. 
as far as um, the first two that came up are correctional and detention facilities but as far as other public safety facility types um, after working through it with the planning board looking at other communities um, those are typically allowed where um, we have higher traffic levels access to traffic signals that kind of thing um, but there are very different impacts between let's say adding a wing to an existing police or fire station um, where everybody that lives near that facility has been used to living near a facility that provides emergency response vehicles um, in and out with uh, potentially sirens and lights or taking out taking off quickly um, and there's a difference between that and a brand new location and to get at that we considered a few different ways um, but decided on in this draft using um, a facility impact uh, analysis that looks at the impacts of a new facility but also looks at the public need because these are all these are all public facilities trying to meet a public need of some kind um, what we decided on was a process that involves both the planning board and council that uh, happens in two steps um, for any of the uses that were deemed to be special exceptions um, new public faith safety facilities uh, in all zones would be deemed as a public uh, a special exception rather and so the first step would be provide a um, impacts and needs analysis that's specific to the proposed facility uh, that can be considered by the city council the council would make a finding on whether or not that um, justification um, but whether or not the needs exceed the impacts um, again, I think that's easier to do on existing locations because people are used to living next to them. Um, but it could be done anywhere based on a specific proposal for a specific facility um, in a zone that it's allowed. I think that's, that's a good summary. Um, if you want to get into individual zones and where individual uses would be allowed, um, we can do that in a little more detail, but it is in your packet. Yeah, thank you, Eric. A quick question on the format for the impact study. Do you have a do you have a template? Uh, were you so, able to get one for Augusta, or is there a standardized template that most developers, um, i.e., architects, are used to submitting? There, there's not an exact standardized form, and I think it depends on what type of facility. But we would be looking for um, all of the impacts that would typically be considered in a site plan review. Uh, would include noise, um, lighting, traffic. Um, we can we can come up with certainly an exact list of that but i think we could really rely on our existing ordinances um, but part of that review would involve the council i think where it differs from most uses and why um, why we chose to involve the council in the process is more on the needs side because um, it's really looking at what are the public needs compared to the impacts we already look at the impacts as part of site plan special exception review the difference is really looking at the, the public need i'd like to pull the council a little bit on this one i think when we're if, if you're asking the council to look at something um in addition to the planning board um that in a period of time and i'm going to just throw out there six months after um if this ordinance passes on friday a second reading that you present back to this council and planning board um the format because there's a lot of different things and yet to be thought of on what this council and future councils are going to have to take in consideration, whether it be revenue stream, traffic, you know, just your normal, you know, binary, if you would, factors. But there's also, you know, other financial factors, uh, just practical factors. Again, I don't know what they are, but I think we should look at them at a, you know, within, and you tell us at what time you think you could have this ready. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was, when, when I read through that, that was the thing that jumped out at me the most is that, um, you know, it might be clearly known, as long as you're in this position, what you're looking for. But if another person comes into this position down the road, what are they going to be looking for? And I and I thought that it was a good opportunity uh, to maybe in the definition section where you're, you're you're going through the different uses and different things to to maybe outline in there. Uh, this is what an impact study would would be, and just say it needs to cover whether it's five things or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, I think that and actually. Um, yeah, I think I think that would be that would be good just to kind of lay out what that means. Well, Dana, do you think you know just put it in parentheses, so to speak, that you know an impact study will be adopted, you know, within by September two thousand twenty-three. I'm just throwing out a date. 
Yeah, yeah that way, because you don't want to tie it all into the ordinance and we'll have to go back and redo it. But having that impact fee, it's almost like a, an overlay, if you would. That impact fee might change, you know, from council to council. I think that's fine. We can certainly do that. And I think the impact side of it is really easy because we have existing ordinances that address impacts of all facilities. It's really that public need side of it that we'll have to spend a little more time defining. I think that's, and if we can find someone from a different community, great. But um, let's at least, uh, by the second reading in here, if you could, and ask the manager if that's okay, have some sort of definitive by date to put in there for, for that impact portion of the zoning. Council, are you good with that? Any comments? And just a question on the impact analysis. Are there other communities that do that? I just, I've never seen it. I, I, I liked the stuff on the jail. I thought that was well done, but I wasn't clear on the impact analysis if that was a standard thing. Like Augusta was a great place to look at because I never thought of that. They must be state, county, and city, I think, all rolled into one city. Yeah, I, um, I didn't see any clear examples of the needs analysis unless they were coming from the facility proposer. Uh, that they had already gone through a public discussion process about what their needs are. Um, the impact side of it, I think, even on private developments, we have that really down clearly, and most communities do. But um, the public needs part of it, I think, a lot of times comes through the discussion about funding a project rather than the, the regulatory side. Uh, one, one other, sorry, one other thing um, on the, the matrix, it looks like there's a couple places that are uh, not filled in. I wonder if maybe if you guys are talking about this tomorrow night at the planning board meeting, could you fill in the lockup facility in the jail uh, usage? I think it's, uh, it just, it, it isn't filled in on page 10. We, and we did fill in those uses in the draft. Um, that matrix is what we took to planning board for the earlier discussion. Um, we noted as well that those were, were empty and we think we have from um, those discussions enough information that we filled it in within the ordinance text itself, but that, that matrix is really a worksheet. Is there any other comments or thoughts on this? This is a further agenda item later on tonight, so we can always debate the merits of it then. Good. Okay, Mr. Cousins, we'll see you in a little bit. Thank you. Next, Glenn Holmes, Community Development Block Grants. No? Okay. What you have in front of you is basically an overview of the community development programs. So every year we have to do an action plan, and about every other year we like to come before you and kind of go through what that process looks like, give you a real quick overview. So on the left-hand side of that graph, you can see what the income limits are. So when you're talking to folks, you can see that a household size at 80% of LMI for a single person household is 44.6, up to a family of four would be 63,700. Just to give you an idea when you're talking to people, trying to understand where they might fall into that, whether or not they're going to qualify or not. And then within the city, we have three census tracts that are actually qualified as low to moderate income in totality. So therefore, anything we do within that, for anybody who lives in that there, don't have to meet quite the same guidelines. So that's downtown Union Street and New Auburn. On the next page, it talks a little bit about <clears throat> the different funding sources we currently have. So obviously, we have the CDBG, the Community Development Block Grant. We also have the Community Development Block Grant CV for COVID. We have the home funds. We have the home ARP, which are COVID related. And we have the lead and healthy homes money. So then it goes across and kind of tells you what the eligible populations are. So under CDBG, it can be an area benefit. Same is for the COVID. The home is a lot of low of income individual. So that person has to qualify based on their own uh, numbers. The home ARP is qualified population, so therefore it's not so much tied to the income, but it's tied to the situation they may be living in. 
and then lead and healthy homes is low to moderate income and children under six. So even if you are maybe over income, but there's a child under six years old, we'd still be able to do work within uh, building um, because there's a fair chance there'll be an another child moving in there as well. And then for eligible uses, we can talk about different things we can do with the money. So your CDBG is really spot blight, home rehab, public services, public infrastructure. Whereas your CV is the public services and public infrastructure, uh, a fair amount of money there went to um, the grab and go program, things like that, to help the elderly. The home is for new construction or rental assistance or home buyer assistance. And the home ARP, we could have built a shelter, but with $750,000 and a 30 year commitment, that didn't really make sense. So we can also do rental assistance, and we're doing mostly supportive services. And then lead abatement and rehab for pre. 1978 homes for the lead program. And then you can see at the bottom, roughly $500,000 annually for CDBG. The CV, CDBG mon money was 472000 one time. Home, we get about a quarter of a million dollars a year for that program. And then the home ARP was 850000 one time. And then the current lead contract is $3.4 million over a three year period. A question? Sure. On these programs, if someone has lives in those areas, downtown, Union Street, New Auburn, then they're eligible to, say, get a lead abatement grant, whether or not they fit the low to moderate income? So the way that works, if you look at it, so those three census tracts are area benefits. So anything we do in that area, so if we wanted, we can automatically do uh, a sidewalk project in that area for infrastructure without having to worry about it, whereas if we went to a, a more affluent area, we wouldn't be able to do it. The actual programs all have individual rules that we, probably, we put together internally. So if a multi-unit um, landlord owns a building that's in one of those areas and their tenants qualify, it's a lot easier to get them qualified without looking at the landlord's financial situation. It's based on who's living there. Great. Thank you. Yep. So the next one um, really looks at kind of how the money gets broken down. So when we're looking at the CDBG funds, the public service is 50, has a 15% cap. So about $80,000 a year goes to public service. So that can be done through grants to other nonprofits. It can be done through grants internally to the city. Um, historically, we've done a fair number of scholarships for summer programs for the summer camp. Um, affordable housing has got 10%. Uh, that we use there, which are uh, self-staff managed projects for about 55000 The lead grant match, so basically 20% of our money, or $110,000, goes towards lead pro the program to use federal dollars to match federal dollars, so we haven't got to use tax dollars to pull down that $3 million lead grant. And then public improvements can be up to 35%, or about $190,000 a year, and that can be um, some benches along the sidewalks, it can be uh, some crosswalks, it can be a lot of different things. It can be roads, uh, so we can actually work with Public Works to do some road work in, inside those census tracts and put that money there. And then we get 20% uh, to for administration to administer the program to pay staff. And then the annual action plan, which is really what this all kind of totals up to be, is that this is really built on a five-year plan. So you have to have a five-year plan, which takes community assessment. Annual action plans have to be done, which is what we're in the process now. And we do citizen participation. So we've had a survey that's been out there for a while already. Uh, we talked about that a couple of months ago. And we're doing those. And then we have a pre-action plan public hearing, which is on the agenda for this evening. So anybody who wants to come up and speak before we even get started can come and talk at that public hearing. And then there's a 30-day public comment period starting tonight. And then we have to have an a detailed uh, annual budget that comes back with a comprehensive narrative addressing all the community needs that you folks will be doing. And the next steps are in March, we'll have the staff action plan based on public input. In April, we'll publish it and let that run for 30 days. And then in May, we'll come back and have you folks all do another public hearing and then vote to approve that plan so we can submit it. Any questions on the process? And I'm, maybe I'm missing this, but um, could we get uh, some information on the previous years? 
i.e. the budget, where I was going for CDBG, how much of it did we actually expend, and how did it match up with the categories that you proposed? Sure. was just going to be the comment I had that I'm looking at the numbers and it's like, well, this is just one year, right. but we recycle money, which is much bigger. And so that's yeah. obviously a yeah, different. Right, yeah, but right now we're looking at doing a, a one million notice of funding uh, just for housing because there's been a lot of home funds that have been sitting in recycling because a lot didn't happen during COVID. So that's been building up. Million bucks. There's a lot of restrictions to the to right. the home, it's not easy. Yeah. The CDBG is right. much easier yeah. to get to, but the home is very, very restricted. Home, you're looking at 30 years restriction on whatever you do. So basically, if you want to put money into a program that's going to have some a four-unit building, then for 30 years, you're going to have to meet all of the HUD guidelines and not charge any higher rent than what they allow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, nothing else? Nothing? Okay. Um, that's it for the public portion of our workshop. We do have an executive session. And I'll entertain a motion pursuant to 1 MRSA 4056C in which premature disclosure would prejudice the comp competitive or bargaining position of the City of Auburn. Do I have a motion? Motion to move, to move in. Second. Motion for Councillor Walker. Second from Councillor Morin. All those in favor? <coughs> Opposed? None being. We now stand in executive session.
Oh, the usuals. Yeah, I guess it's that. It's like working out. I get bored if I don't want to work out. That's not like sometimes I don't want to ski if I'm just skiing by myself. You know, even though you don't. Okay, ready? Good evening, folks. Welcome to the City Council meeting for February 13th, 2023. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, we have two consent items on the agenda tonight. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Uh, I have a motion for Councilor Staples, second for Councilor Walker. All those in favor? Opposed? None being passed. Seven zero. Okay, next to the minutes of the January 17th, 2023 regular City Council meeting. Are there any corrections? None being able to entertain a motion at this time to approve the minutes of the January 17th, 2023 regular City Council meeting. Motion to approve. Second. Motion Councilor Walker, second for Councilor Staples. Uh, all those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry. One abstention. One abstention. So six, zero, one. Now on to communications, presentations, and recognition. First one is the state of the city address uh, by me. Uh, this is pre-recorded, so I am going to let this run its course. Good evening, residents of the city of Auburn. As your mayor, it's important to periodically share with you the state of our great city, to summarize the previous year, and to give you a vision of what is to come, to share with you the good and the not so good in a truthful and succinct fashion. During this biannual State of the City Address, I am beyond proud to report that, like the people who live here, the state of our city is strong. Through hard work, vigorous public debate, and with a focus on execution, the City Council, Planning Board, and City staff, under the leadership of City Manager Phil Kroll and Assistant Manager Brian Wood, have passed some of the nation's most meaningful zoning reforms designed to empower the individual, right generational wrongs, and foster an environment of success. Zoning reform alone could not have altered our future, but when you combine it with massive government reforms, elimination of 40% of our permitting fees and corresponding regulations, streamlining service delivery, creating financial incentives to rehabilitate our most vulnerable neighborhoods, developing grants that help pay for home efficiency upgrades, the building of accessory dwelling units on your land, grants to promote neighborhood stores, and youth recreational opportunities sponsored by area nonprofits, small business loan pools, and so much more. The transformation can and will be life-changing for our city. Just last year, the city of Auburn permitted a record-setting $73 million in projects, and we are on the verge of unleashing hundreds of millions of dollars in new value, making Auburn's future and yours that much brighter. But we don't have to wait to see the results these reforms are making. We can see them every day throughout our city. We see the beautiful new Barney's basketball courts in the gully, the ones that sit beside our brand new futsal court. New playgrounds being built around our city, including Maine's largest ADA accessible playground at Lake Grove Park. We see construction crews throughout Auburn crafting and rehabilitating a new generation of housing. We see a resurgence of community pride brought to life at some of Maine's best festivals, such as the signature event at New Year's Eve Auburn, which drew over 5,000 people to the heart of our downtown. And our upcoming May is for Mainers Lobster Festival this coming May 6th. We see decreasing crime rates and growing career and educational opportunities for all our citizens at some of the most innovative companies in the world, from Thomas Mosher cabinet makers to Future Guard, employing some of the most talented craftsmen in Maine, to Procter & Gamble, Auburn Manufacturing, Strainwright, and so many more, creating new technology that is changing the way our country innovates. Simply travel through our great city, and you'll see new retail and commercial stores opening, housing developments rising, and our manufacturing businesses continue to invest in Auburn. High paying jobs, an enviable location within Maine, and as a result, we have seen a truly amazing increase in people wanting to move here. So much so 
The Realtor.com named Auburn the 10th hottest real estate market in the country in 2022. In the country. Auburn has been profiled in new articles across the United States, pointing to as an example of how to reinvigorate a stagnant community. And though we might not always see or hear it, folks from all over the country know us, envy us, and want to be like us. When we look at our current and future success, we also must include the work of the Auburn School Committee and staff. We are just months away from opening an incredible new state-of-the-art high school, and the, and the focus and determination shown by all involved is mind-boggling, to say the least. We've also worked together with our partners at Central Maine Community College to provide early college access for our high schoolers, allowing them to explore new careers in the trades and get a jump start on entering the local career market, making our students and city stronger. When you look at how our educational proficiency scores have defied the state and national trends and improved an average of 30% at the same time as a new school is being constructed and these new programming options are being rolled out, well, you simply have to say thank you. Under the leadership of Chair Karen Matthew and Superintendent Dr. Connie Brown, the school committee has made many operational reforms, working with the city to create best-in-class service, an economy of scale, valuing every tax dollar entrusted to them, and making difficult decisions that have and will continue to prepare our youth for the careers that exist here, now, and in the future. The state of our city and the people here are not only strong, but resolute. We will face challenges that could, if not attended to, derail what we have worked on over the last five years, pushing Auburn back to a time where we were weaker, poorer, and the future was less bright than it is today. This year, we will be faced with the most challenging budget since the recession of 2009. Inflation isn't impacting the cost of government, just like it's taking a toll on you and your family. The massive desire for so many people to live in Auburn is, on one hand, exciting. On the other hand, it's causing steep increases in home values and hence property taxes and a shortage of housing of all kinds. These significant issues have brought Auburn to a decision point. If we are to continue to be a city with city style services and amenities, how do we pay for them? The options are clear. We either raise taxes, increase our taxable value, or we cut services. And cuts to things like EMS, police, fire education, those cuts have a lasting and resounding effect on the future health of our city. The city council and I have chosen to grow our base to increase taxable value through the growth of market rate housing, commercial and retail enterprises, and investment in innovative policies that will decrease the cost of existing housing while allowing more attainable housing to be built, especially for young families and seniors. For too long, our regressive zoning policies have stifled home construction and forced growing families to other towns, increasing their commute and our traffic, decreasing our tax base, and denying our community with our most valuable resource, people. This was done based on many false notions. One of the most horrendous of these is that kids are bad, that they're costly and don't add value. That can't be farther from the truth. In fact, I'm gonna propose for consideration by the council a series of investments into childcare partnerships that will increase the amount of affordable childcare openings within the city, allowing Auburn families to not have to choose work over having children. Yes, we need more kids. Our schools can handle an increase of over 300 within our current capacity. It's time we maximize return on our educational investments and encourage families to move and grow here within Auburn. To further uh, accelerate our response to the housing crisis, I will introduce a directive for the City Council that staff will present a plan to acquire through eminent domain, corporate-owned, derelict, and undeveloped land and properties by May 1. We can no longer sit by while corporations practice speculative land monopolies and refuse to address crumbling buildings. We must face this head on and act in the public interest. I'll also ask the City Council to join me in encouraging the Auburn Housing Authority Board of Directors to fulfill their mission statement and take immediate action towards the creation of additional owner-occupied family housing within Auburn. Creating this option will allow people to become homeowners, build vibrant neighborhoods of hardworking people, and help us eliminate generational poverty within our city. Next, I want the people of Auburn to know that the actions we have taken as a city to protect Lake Auburn are sound, and frankly, decades past due. Study after study and expert after expert have validated our policy initiatives and agree there is no room for politics when it comes to protecting our drinking water. There's either right or wrong, and I am grateful to be on the side of right. As we continue to negotiate 
and navigate zoning reforms, we're finally able to address the Agriculture and Resource Protection Zone. We have carved out over 4,400 acres surrounding Lake Auburn, which will soon be a conservation district, protecting this extraordinary natural resource and providing responsible recreational access, such as fishing, hiking, and biking. It will be a true oasis within our city. This shows how we can achieve a balance between natural resource protection and ecologically attentive home construction. The same thoughtful and focused approach, using the latest in research, will allow us to achieve similar goals in South Auburn by removing an archaic and discriminatory income standard and replacing it with ordinances specifically designed to limit mass development and identify and protect natural resources, we can achieve what so many communities have failed to do, a true balance between humans and the natural world. Understand that not everyone will like our initiatives. Everyone wants progress, but very few people actually want change. There will continue to be letters to the editor, ill-informed attacks on social media, and lies and rumors spread at the grocery store. These are all designed to divide, inflame tensions, and keep the status quo, or worse yet, to take us backward to a time not that far in the past when power and wealth were concentrated with a few to the detriment of the many. We need your help. Your help spreading the word about policy initiatives, grant opportunities, and our city's successes and challenges. This city council, along with our talented and dedicated staff, need your help. We will continue to face challenges head on, navigate change and growth, and together, we will all continue to embrace our city's motto of no steps backward. Thank you and have a great evening. Jen? Very good. Next on the agenda, communication from Frederick Kunis, Auburn Suburban Baseball and Softball. Mr. Manager, did you want to convey that? No, that was just a communication. That was just a communication that we want to make sure was involved uh, in the packet. Um, the individual was not able to be here at the last meeting when um, when the uh, some of that action was taking place. So this was just a uh, letter of thank you. Okay. And next, special city council meeting, February 17th, 2023. That agenda is posted. There's only one item on the agenda. Mayor, that, that agenda will be posted on Wednesday. Oh, I'm sorry, on Wednesday. Um, and that's for the second reading of the government facility ordinance that we'll have later on tonight. Council communication, start off to the right. Any council communication? Mr. Manager? We're in the clear. I got, I got. Oh, oh. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to say I was uh, unable to make it to the last uh, basketball games at Ed Little, but I went the week before and was able to watch the girls play uh, Portland, and it was a great game. Uh, congratulations to the, to the Red Eddies for a great season. Uh, and I also wanted to comment a little bit on the – the Sun Journal articles about the uh, the homeless uh, warm, warming shelters. Uh, I think that you know the city did put forth a good effort on that. I want them to continue putting forth a good effort, and I'd like to see a continued effort in uh, educating the public on what we have done and what we continue to do. Manager, you're clear. Okay. Uh, next, open this up to the first open session of the night. Members of the public are invited to speak to the council about any issue directly related to city business, which is not on tonight's agenda. Please step up to the microphone, give us your name, address, limit your comments to around three minutes. Good, Good evening. My name is Larry Pelletier. I live at uh, 129 2nd Street in Auburn. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was here and, and addressed you folks uh, on the topic of homelessness. When I got home, I uh, Googled, why do people become homeless? I've got seven of the, of the top reasons, and I'm sure there, there are more. First reason is job loss. According to a recent study, job loss is the number one reason why people become homeless. Almost a third of people said that uh, are homeless because of job loss. Number two, eviction. My eviction did not come with a dramatic pounding on the floor, as it happens in the movies, just an unceremonious letter lumped in between credit card offers and credit card bills. <coughs> Though they didn't let on my, much, my children sensed my fear and anxiety. I fought back tears dis discovering small cardboard square, a small cardboard square in my seven-year-old daughter's suitcase. In blue crayon, she had drawn a stick figure with a frowning face. Above the figure, it read, I am homeless. 
Marcus of Maryland. According to the New York T Times, four million residents are legally evicted each year. Estimates suggest that about 14% of those families end up in homeless shelters. This means that annually over half a million people become homeless due to landlord eviction. Another way, another way is by a family member. When asked, many uh, individuals say their parents or siblings kick them out. So domestic altercations usually are the culprit. People also become homeless because a family member kicks them out. Number three, separation from spouse. Like the unfortunate woman who became homeless because her husband passed away, another reason is a separation from her spouse. Whether, whether a divorce, a breakup, or death, these situations usually happen unexpectedly. When one does not see a breakup, divorce, or death of a spouse coming, homelessness can be the result. Number four, health issues, poor physical health. Now, the common reason why people become homeless is due to physical health issues. In why homelessness is a problem, it, it was said that the cold and uncared for are two times as likely as the house to suffer from diabetes, hypertension, and a heart attack. They are 20 times more likely to suffer from HIV. While the stress of homelessness can sometimes create or compound these problems, the problems themselves can cause homelessness. In health and homelessness, Maywish Moyes tells us there is a strong correlation between health and homelessness. Poor health often causes homelessness. Poor mental health. I have been homeless twice, once, in my, once I was 23 and again at, at 30. Both times it was due to mental health problems. The first time it happened, I left my job because I wasn't well. I went to stay with friends. There I had a panic, panic attack. My friend said, we love you, but you're starting to drive us mad. So I left and wandered the streets. Hey, Larry. It, oh, I'm sorry, just over. The, it, if this is an article or something, if you could, could you send this to us electronically to the council? I can. I mean, it's, it, it's good. I just want to make sure we're you know, keeping on time, but I definitely would like to read it. I'm sure the council would as okay. well. Okay. Can I finish it? You're over your three minutes, Larry. No matter what the topic is, we have to keep it to that. I'm sorry. All right. All right. Is there anybody else who would like to speak in our first open session? Good evening. Uh, Bruce Ryu, 85 Mary Carroll Street in Auburn. At the last city council meeting in January, uh, at this junction of the meeting, I came and asked the city council to, uh, at a future meeting, meaning the one in February, to um, take up a proposal to have the taxpayers reimburse the Auburn Water District ratepayers for uh, legal fees that were brought about because of the actions of the city council. So it's clearly the city council making changes in the watershed area that has brought about a lawsuit from the city of Lewiston to the Auburn Water District. So uh, the ratepayers, people who, who drink Auburn, Lake Auburn water at their home, are the ones that are paying for these legal fees when the beneficiaries, if all these changes are made, are going to be people in the watershed area who don't even drink uh, public water. They have wells. So clearly, these legal fees should be paid for by the taxpayers, not the Auburn Water District ratepayers. Now, um, I did follow up my conversation with an email to a couple of counselors and the mayor the next day, uh, and I haven't heard back, but um, this is unfair to the ratepayers, and I really would ask that uh, sometime in the near future, uh, that the city council please address that. Thank you. As a point of uh, protocol, any agenda item has to be brought forth by two members of the city council. Even if I have an agenda item, I still need the support of at least two members. So that's how anything becomes on or gets on the agenda. Oh, well, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I'll, uh, I'll work on that. Okay. Anybody else like to speak during the first open session? If not, I'm going to close it. And we're going to move on. Next is order 
165-1219-2022, allocating $145,000. Point of order. Uh, you skipped one. Oh, 24. I'm sorry. Apologies. Next is ordinance 24-1205-2022. Zoning map amendment. Amending a portion of 150 Andrew Drive, parcel ID 347-003 from agriculture and resource protection and low density country residential zoning districts to the suburban residential as recommended by the planning board. This is a public hearing and second reading. Do I have a motion? So moved. moved. Second. Okay, I got a motion Councilor Milks. Second from Councilor Staples. Open this up to the public. Anybody in public like to speak? If so, please step up to the podium and give us your name and address. And if you could, let me your comments at three minutes. My name is Ryan Smith. I live at 14 Beaver Street. Um, I'm here to talk about the, uh, the, the city attorney's recent opinion that I found on the table over there. Um, I don't think this adequately addresses the legal concerns brought forth by citizens for this rezoning. The reason why is I made a FOIA request to the city and I got information on this. Um, I want to particularly focus in on a few that I will submit for public record. Um, and then also the MMAs, the Maine Municipal Association's uh, legal issues manual for the planning board. Um, I do believe there are more violations here not addressed by the city's legal counsel that will void this petition and make it have to restart from the beginning. Um, first of all, according to the MMA's planning board manual, planning board members should not even discuss applications outside of the public setting. Um, it says, under no circumstances should planning board members meet with someone representing just one side of the issue outside of a public meeting setting, which clearly this real estate agent slash um, planning board member did do that. But also, board members should not even discuss an application with, with the code enforcement officer outside of a public meeting in order uh, to avoid due process problems. Clearly, I have emails from a FOIA request showing that real estate agent slash planning board member having conversations on multiple occasions with code enforcement officers. According to an August 18th email, um, this um, planning board member even wrote the petition language for the petitioner. That is clearly a conflict and not addressed by our city's legal counsel. Um, and then based on the FOIA request, um, this planning board member was involved in the process since the beginning, not just as a circulator, of the petition, but from the very beginning as a planning board member, which included in consultation with city staff. Therefore, the petition process from the beginning is tainted by violations and is void and must be restarted. Uh, the petitioner must start from the beginning without consultation from any board member or any board member that's been on the board within the past year, according to a state statute. Um, and according to Title 30A-2605, Section 4, an official cannot attempt to influence a decision that the official has an interest, which this plain form of real estate agent would benefit from this from selling a piece of land that is now more valuable after the rezoning. Um, so it not only is it inappropriate for a plain board member to be involved in the app applicant's portion of the process at all, but this plain board member had financial gain based on the success of the petition, which includes wording the petition correctly, and also this plain board member nursed it through the entire process by following up with staff. I do not believe these points were considered by our legal counsel, and it's clearly it's clear that the violation extends beyond the planning board member's involvement at the November planning board meeting and the involvement in circulating the petition, which is still inappropriate and probably illegal. Um, so I'd like for everyone here to consider reaching out to legal counsel again or even just having the petitioner completely start over, redo this process without any violations to make it completely legal. Thank you. Stephen Beal, uh, 575 Johnson Road. Before I raise the matters that I was going to address, I think that in nature of the matters that uh, Mr. Smith has just raised, it would be necessary for the council to indicate whether or not it's going to follow the recommended procedures uh, for restarting this uh, in order to bring in the petition properly uh, before the planning board in the first instance and thus on through the council before anybody else makes any substantive remarks. Sir, this is public discussion. It's not a question and answer. Answers to your interrogatories will not be given. No, I'm not, I'm not asking an interrogatory. I'm making a statement. 
Okay. Are you done your public comments, sir? No, I have not yet begun. Sir, you have begun, actually. I'm sorry. This is your time for right. public comment. Uh, this uh, is a parcel in East Auburn, which is designated as a growth area by the city for the future. That does not mean that you have to build something on every parcel of land in this area. Uh, this parcel of land is shown on the planning board's um, the planning staff's memorandum of January 10, and it's further shown on this map, which is a superimposition of the subject parcel on top of the U.S. Geological Survey map for this area. I have the original Geological Survey map here if you wish to see it. Uh, as can clearly be seen, there are some very steep gradients here. On this map, every contour line represents 10 feet in elevation. The heavy black lines are 50 feet elevations. <coughs> Beginning at the, uh, on Andrew Drive here, uh, the elevation at the corner of the discontinued North River Road is approximately 300 feet, it's 296. The land rises very steeply up in the space of 500 feet linearly. It goes up over 250 feet, which is a gradient of uh, 250 over 500, one to two, or sometimes as much as 45 degrees, and in many cases, uh, more than uh, 25 degrees. The planning staff has recognized this because they then generated this plan uh, of their own, not at the instance of any citizens, but this shows the subject parcel from its northernmost boundary here to its southernmost boundary here and has this band across the entire length of the parcel which is, varies from 150 to 200 feet wide, depending on the particular point along that line. That entire band is greater, is equal to or greater than a 25% grade. Uh, and according to Auburn ordinances, no housing can be built on land of 25% or greater grade. No roads can be built on a grade of greater than 8%. One cannot reach the top of this parcel from Andrew Drive by means of going up over this significant band of very steep land. Therefore, this parcel is just simply not suitable for a conversion to a suburban residential zone Thank you, Mr. because Bill. it can't be used for that purpose. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Razel Ward. I live at 1372 North River Road. I've lived in East Auburn for over six years now. During that time, I have noticed serious issues with storm water runoff on Andrew Drive. During rainstorms and spring snow melts, large quantities of storm water run off the steep rocks. You heard about the topography just now. The steep rock slopes on the westerly side of Andrew Drive in several locations. This causes many of the basements on both the easterly and the westerly sides of Andrew Drive to flood and creates a large pools of standing water on both sides of the road. There were only seven culverts, a pipe, and one outflow structure along Andrew Drive in the proposed area of the zoning change, and they do not already have the capacity but can't handle more storm runoff. Because of the hill steep slopes, which are comprised primarily of rock and ledge, water moves very quickly down those steep slopes. Consequently, any further development of residential structures, driveways, and access <coughs> roads on the easterly side of this lot will create even greater quantities of stormwater, all going down to Andrew Drive. Further stormwater management systems on the lot will be difficult and costly to construct and maintain because of the extreme steepness. Although this could be developed, it will be at a serious expense, which then begs the question, who are we building for because our current residents in Auburn would not be able to afford a home that had so much costly development. Therefore, because of these physical conditions, the lot is poorly suited, more than just poorly, it is ultimately not suited for residential development. I am respectfully asking that the planning board not approve this requested zoning change. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Lisa Bisson. I live at 199 Andrew Drive. 
in East Auburn. I've owned property in East Auburn for 15 years, and I've been part of this neighborhood all of my life. We're here tonight because of a petition that was signed by 26 registered voters who live from the Southern Auburn Penley neighborhood to Southern Downtown Auburn. However, you also have an informal petition signed by 41 registered voters who actually live in East Auburn, and they oppose a zoning change. Among the many reasons the residents in East Auburn signed this petition is the lack of adequate infrastructure for development in this location. There are no sidewalks for the general public or for the children to safely walk to the East Auburn Community School. Andrew Drive, Oak Hill, and North River Road are all dead-end roads that have only one way into or out of these residential neighborhoods. This creates a public safety problem when the roads become blocked because of downed trees, utility poles, wires, preventing fire trucks, ambulance, police, public works equipment from getting into these areas during emergency. These roads are relatively narrow and there are no turnarounds on any of these three roads. We recently had a fire truck that came on a 911 call to Andrew Drive. The fire truck had to back down Andrew Drive in order to leave the neighborhood. In fact, the Auburn plow has been stuck already once this year, and last year they were stuck again. There is no public water and sewer lines or street lights beyond the East Auburn Community School. The East Auburn Community School lacks adequate capacity for additional students. In fact, it currently has a double wide modular unit to meet the needs of the current student population. For these and many other reasons that have been presented tonight, the East Auburn community respectfully asks that you do not approve this zoning change. Thank you. Is there anybody else from the community that would like to speak? Good evening, my name is John Cleveland. I reside at 183 Davis Avenue in Auburn, Maine. I'm here to speak tonight on this proposed zoning change. To summarize, you've been presented this evening with extensive information uh, why this requested zoning change on this lot is not suitable or appropriate for suburban residential development. Uh, the information included the elevations made, this is the map prepared by your own planning staff, which shows this wide band of slope that is 25% or greater in that area. What that is to illustrate is in those areas you are not permitted to put any building because of the slope size. As you can see, that bars the entire effort to try to get up over the hill and even on that westerly side, there are areas that are very steep as well um, in that section. Further, under your own ordinances, under Article 5, Section 2, uh, Division 2, Section 46.175, which, detail, which details the design and construction of local roads, it forbids any road to be constructed that has a grade of greater than 8%. Your staff has concurred that there is no possible way of developing a road up those steep 25% grades uh, that will meet those standards. So Andrew Drive is the only abutting road. There are no other abutting roads to this lot to get there. Those slopes prevent even accessing most of the lot, not to mention even if you got there, the slopes are still above 25% in those areas. Further, the soils on the area are really primarily rock and ledge. All you have to do is look at the cliffs. You can see them jutting out. So the soils are not really suitable for major construction in that area. And as you've heard, there are huge amounts of running water that come off, storm water that come off those slopes and flood the Andrew Drive area uh, very regularly and are not appropriate for lots of more building in that area at all without creating further problems. Andrew Drive is a dead end road. There is an in no appropriate turnaround at the back at the back side of that. If you have storms and that road gets blocked off, it creates public safety hazards because you can't get emergency equipment in there for public uh, 
uh, for public safety. Uh, additionally, the infrastructure in the area is not adequate to support suburban residential development. It's a relatively narrow road. It has an inadequate turnaround for emergency vehicles, school buses, trash pickup, and all of the rest of the public services that use large vehicles. There's no public of water or soil there. It ends Thank you at, very much, Mr. Cleveland. Your time is up. It ends at East Your time is up, Mr. Cleveland. Thank I you. would request that you reject this request. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Change. Cleveland. Your time is up. Is there anybody else in the public that would like to speak? None being, I'll close the open session. Bring it back to the council. Uh, council, before you de uh, your debate, just a couple points I want to bring up on the legal standpoint. I just want to remind you all that during the initial first reading of this ordinance, you did have questions and send it back for a restart of the process through planning board, which it has gone through with a planning board that received legal training, memos and so forth, and now it's back. So this is the second time. I just want to make sure that the public, as well as this council, remember that this is the second time you've already sent it back for review based upon some findings that might needed to be, ad that needed to be addressed. Um, I also will state that, you know, just remind everybody, especially uh, Councilor Staples, I think you remember this, obviously, any type of planned unit development, splitting of land, um, more than once in a five-year period has to go in front of the planning board for a review, a site review, and they look at some of this, obviously, information. Council makes decisions along with the planning board and zoning. We don't make decisions based upon development or the approval or non-approval of homes. It's just the ability for something to be looked at further. Uh, so I just want to make sure we're all clear. I think it's a good time as we have more and more of these coming through to really look at that process. Um, and I do think about the dead end roads and I did some research. Uh, there's a, a dead end road that we should all be aware of, Briarcliff, with over, I think 40 to 50 homes on Briarcliff. There's only one way in and one way out of Briarcliff. Um, they don't have sidewalks. And that seems to be a perfectly acceptable neighborhood to the residents that are there and as well as to the community. Um, and the pragmatic area too. I mean, if something has a 20% grade and it's unbuildable, if it's a reason, if we set a precedence of not zoning because of that reason, we also set the precedence to have any type of residential land with an over 20% grade that's unbuildable to be rezoned away from residential into an agricultural resource protection zone, for example. So it does, op it does concern me um, that it could be open-ended because once we do something for one reason, that could also come back and have a ripple effect in others. So I just wanted, those are some of the notes from the public and I thank the public for bringing them up. Um, one of my jobs is to make sure that we're all informed of what's happened and you can make your thoughtful decision. So I'll open this up to debate. Is there any debate or discussion? Councilor? Yeah, uh, some of the concerns brought up by Mr. Smith are especially concerning uh, about the process uh, going around this. Um, today we received a, a, an email from the city manager explaining the legal opinion that was referenced by Mr. Smith. And I, I guess I would just ask the, the city manager to discuss whether all of Mr. Smith's concerns were brought up because the email that you sent us didn't seem to uh, address those. So the extent of uh, the inquiry to the uh, legal, um, all the items were discussed. Ultimately, the item regarding whether or not a petition um, can be withdrawn after submitted by registered voters is really what the focus was. Um, you can have um, a process that I believe took place that uh, I believe was clarified moving forward regarding a, a sitting uh, planning board member regarding presenting to the um, to the planning board uh, to the extent of being involved in the process. Um, however, as it pertained to the um, petition itself being circulated, whether or not it was or not, that's we, I, don't, I have no idea on that. Um, but regardless, uh, we needed. I wanted to make sure we had legal. Um, review of that to see for the council what your steps would be that if that petition could be withdrawn and you have the, her finding there uh, regarding that as far as um, I was provided all the uh, email correspondence um, with with staff staff was making clarifications uh, provided a sample of a previous petition Hammond Lumber Company um, 
I believe there was communication uh, back and forth on process. There was communication uh, regarding um, staff's uh, opinion, um, which I believe uh, I was told that um, an op the staff had made an opinion prior to a public hearing. Um, staff will take a look at the petition. Staff will look at ordinance. Staff will look at um, the scope for the planning board on what that decision should be as it meets the uh, standards outlined in ordinance, not the uh, feedback at a public hearing. The public hearing feedback is for the appointed members, which is the planning board, to take into consider, just as you as council now, as you heard public opinion uh, during this process, now need to take that into account. Um, so uh, through with the discussion with the attorney, I feel that the items that needed to be covered were covered um, and, uh, and her decision uh, I made available for you. And Councillor Staples, just as a reminder, when we sent this back, there was a new planning board that came on, a new session, and they did have um, a several hour legal briefing and communication with, or training with our in-house legal. Okay. Any other questions or debate? Councillor Greg, Gary? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do defend a person's right to petition for whatever cause, so I'm not going to challenge this on whether or not he could or couldn't circulate a petition because I've circulated petitions before. But I do think that I do take issue to the fact that this planning board member, which I know it's been addressed, he made a profit, he consulted, and he helped this developer or this proposed developer do his thing. I think if this de de uh, planning board member did not present it, did not discuss it, did not so see Councilor Gary, I just want to give you a warning. This, this conversation debate has to be focused on the actual merits of the zoning That's request. That's what but I'm I, I doing. Just, I just want to be very careful that you don't step over the line of libel because it's not about an individual's actions as per legal. This is about the merits of the request. If you start right. talking about a you know, breach of confidentiality, uh, making money, profit on, you know, that, that could be termed as legally liable and I want to help you avoid that. Thank you. But given the fact that if this was any other project, and it wasn't a planning board member working behind it, I think the planning board members, with all their training, would look at this with a different magnifying glass. And they would have seen more of what the public, the good people that have come today, and at the last time, that have said the issues why this piece of property should not have a building built on it for all the various reasons, and that is why I cannot and will not support this project, and I'll be voting no. Any other debate? Comment? Councilor Whiting? Sorry. Um, I oppose this. I feel that there might be the opportunity for some limited development along Andrew Drive, but the nature of our ordinance is such that because of the size of the property under a planned unit development, a large development could actually occur on developable property, which would be out of the essential character of the neighborhood. I think this should be looked at uh, by the Comprehensive Plan Committee, uh, which, well, we blew that one, but uh, if we'd done that right, I think maybe this would have been dis discussed more, but, um, the votes aren't going to go my way, but I'm going to say my piece, and I think it's a bad idea the way it's presented. Is there any other comments? None being. I'm going to ask for a vote. Roll call a vote, please. Councillor Hawes. Yes. Councillor Milks. Yes. Councillor Morin. Yes. Councillor Walker. Councillor Staples. Yes. Councillor Gary. Well, well, oh. <laughs> push the button. Oh, okay. 
Okay. Councilor, Councilor Staples. Staples. Yes. Okay. Councilor Gary. No. <clears throat> Councilor Whiting. No. Ordinance passes by a vote of 5 2. Next is order 165 1219 2022, allocating $145,000 of American Rescue Plan Act funds for the acquisition of the shovel ready housing plan. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Second from Councilor House. Open this up to the public for comment. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak? Please step to the podium and state your name and address. Let me comments for three minutes. None being. Okay, I'll bring it back to uh, Council. Council, very quickly, I proposed this. Um, I think it's a good idea. It's a solid idea. But after talking with members of the governor's office and legislatures and seeing what's been happening in other states on the same topic, they're actually taking this up at the state level. Oh, and they should in Maine. Vermont has. Other states are, and providing that, again, paying for it with state funds and providing that to all municipalities that want or so desire. So I normally probably would not uh, ask you to not support something that I initialized, but I, in this case I am, um, because I think it might be redundant and a waste of finances, especially if the state does end up doing this. And I will be testifying March 3rd to the legislature, and this is one of our recommendations. So. In, in light of that, um, I do think this is a good idea. I don't want it to not happen. I think that we should wait and see if the state does it. And if they do it, then we shouldn't do this. So in light of that, I would move that we table this indefinitely and we could always bring it back. If we, indefinite? No. Couldn't I, bring, couldn't I bring it back if I did the motion to table it indefinitely? No. No. Ah, how can we date, do this? You need a date certain. Go 120 days. Hmm? I'll make the motion to table this for 120 days. Second. You modify it. Okay. I have a motion to table this for 120 point days. Of, point of order. Could we nail down a date? Yes. Um, it's 120 days may fall on Sunday. Well, special meetings. That's what <coughs> yeah. If I could chime in, I think that I understand what Councilor Staples is saying. Um, the moment that you place this into a tabled uh, format, we'll be watching that, making sure it gets back to you, uh, ensuring that that happens. Um, but it might look completely different depending on what takes place. I think that once the finding is determined at the state, um, the council can easily direct staff to say, now that we know, can you prepare this and present this back to the council uh, now that we know the full finding? So that way there you're not still carrying over something that as it was originally uh, prepared, was very different scope. So it would just be helpful if, as the mayor suggested, if this just fails and then we'll reintroduce it. But it's completely up to you, council. That's fair enough, I, I retract my motion. Yep. So we saw the original motion on the floor, um, which is to approve this. Is there any other motions or comments? None being, I'll ask for a vote. All those in, excuse me, roll call vote, please. Senator. Uh, Councillor no. Hawes. No. No. Councillor Milks. No. Councillor Morin. No. Councillor Walker. Yes. Councillor Staples. No. Councillor Gary. No. Councillor Whiting. No. By vote of six one. Thank you. It fails. Okay. Next is public hearing for the Community Development Block Grant and Home Annual Action Plan. There'll be no action on this item tonight. I'll open this up to the public. It's a public hearing. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak? If so, please step to the podium and state your name and address. And if you could, let me your comments to approximately three minutes. Larry Pelletier, part two. Uh, a quarter of the entire homeless population is mentally ill. 150 million people are homeless worldwide. Out of those, a significant majority emerge displaced due to their mental illness. Mental illness causes homelessness because an individual cannot often sustain employment. Not being able to pay the rent, they are forced out on the streets. Friends and family often don't even know they're homeless. They stop socializing entirely. Number five, domestic violence. 
Domestic violence is another reason why people become homeless. In the city of Los Angeles, for example, domestic violence displaces more than 18,000 people per year. Fleeing, fleeing to avoid domestic abuse, victims often end up on the streets. Substance abuse, number six. When I was in London, I started taking drugs. That stopped me from sorting my, myself out and finding a place. It wasn't a nice time, and there were way too many, not many jobs around. I ended up being homeless on the streets. I served a few spells in prison, but I would usually end up on the streets. Tony from Somerset. As was the case with Tony from the quote above, another reason why people become homeless is drug use. Approximately 26% of the down and out abuse substances other than alcohol. Like so many other causes of homelessness, drug use can be both a cause and a result for their situation. 68% of the general public, when asked, thought that substance abuse was the main reason why people became homeless. The truth is the number is far less. Only 24% of the population uses substances. Alcohol. Studies show that 38% of homeless respondents suffer from alcoholism. In Million Dollar Murray, Michael Gladwell, tells the story of a homeless man in Reno, Nevada, who cost the state nearly $1 million in medical and incarceration bills due to his alcoholism. While drug is, use is more common among the younger generations, alcohol abuse is more common among the older. Number seven, incarceration. The final reason why people become homeless is incarceration. After leaving prison, it can be difficult to find employment. Because of this, many individuals with a criminal record end up on the streets. In the fascinating short video, The Vicious Cycle of Incarceration and Homelessness, PBS NewsHour explains this quite well. Uh, another reason I want to come here tonight is because uh, right after I was here a couple of weeks ago, I was at, at the past time and reading the paper and, and I read the article about the, the city of Auburn deciding to uh, to help the homeless homeless folks during that extremely cold spell with the opening up a, a warming center. I just wanted to applaud every one of you, the whole council, a mayor, the city manager, s assistant manager, and staff, and also the folks that that helped out businesses supplying food and, and whatever. Thank and, you, uh, On March 25th, 25 human remains were found at an encampment, encampment in Erie County, I believe that's the Buffalo area, where they had over six feet of snow. Yeah, Larry, I'm sorry, you, you exceeded your three minutes okay. this time. But thank you, and trust me, I, I don't like to cut anyone. I bring this to the forefront. I don't want to cut anyone off who's congratulating right. us. I think that's awesome. Right. When, you, when you see somebody that's, that's asking for, for help, don't assume that they're, you know, some, I've heard some people say, get a job. These are the reasons why they're out there. Got it. Thank you, Larry. Is there anybody else who would like to speak on the CDBG and Home Annual Action Plan? Good evening. Annie Titus, uh, 24 Ruby Light Lane. Uh, I attended the workshop, and I, I kind of saw what was going on with the action plan, and I applaud the mayor brought up wanting to see an accounting of what happened last year. And I've always asked year after year that we have some sort of a goal, and then how did we do against that goal when spending this money? In the past, it's been very hard, I've been told, to be able to quantify how the effectiveness of money. One of them was lifting people out of poverty. And okay, well, what did we do and how did we do? Well, you really can't measure that. Well, I think that we need to do more measuring of how the money is used, and if it's not working, that's how we know to switch to something else. So, to caveat on top of what you said, knowing what happened last year, but also with this plan should be some sort of a goal, and then how do we do against goal, and if it didn't work, the following year we do something different. Right. Is there anybody else who would like to speak during this public hearing? If not, I will close the public hearing. Next is Ordinance 02-0213-2023. Amending the definition and use of standards related to public safety facilities, detention facilities, correctional facilities, and or governmental offices at a site on which the use does, does not currently exist. This is the first reading and the public hearing will be held during the second reading. Do I have a motion? So moved. Councilor Staples, do I have a second? Second. Second, Councilor Mill. Open this up to the public for comment. Is there any members of the public that would like to speak? If so, please step up to the podium. 
Give us your name and address, and if you could, limit your comments to three minutes. Good evening again. Andy Titus, part two, 24 Rubelite Lane. Um, I'm a little disturbed about this because when it first came about, we had a moratorium. We've been doing this for a year, and it was aimed at public safety and or detention centers. And then when I read what was in the packet today, I see that it's far-reaching. It's the school department. It looks like Auburn Water and Sewer Districts, if they want to do something that's not within a particular zone, they're going to have to come before council and get do the study and give you the needs analysis before, before we can do anything. An extra layer of government on top of going to the planning board and get what is typical. I think this is kind of overreach. I think it's far, you don't realize until you start thinking about all the situations that come up, you folks are going to have to have a, a vote on. And then it becomes politics, not necessarily planning board, an ordinance that allows something, they follow the rules, and unless it's a real special exception, you folks don't get involved. But now it looks like almost every time one of these agencies wants to do something, you folks have got to have a four to, I mean, at least four votes to approve it. I just think this is really wrong, and I know that you're under the gun because you need to get this done. We're having a workshop on the same night as we're having the first reading, and then we have the second reading less than a week away. That sounds like we've got to rush this through, and I know the reason for it, but it certainly looks bad that we're rushing this through, and there's a lot to this. You think it's simple. If you've read that and see every, every organization that's going to have to come to you and get your permission before it goes anywhere else, or maybe after it's gone through the entire process at the planning board, but it still has to get past you before they can do it. I just think this is far-reaching and wrong. Thanks. Is there anybody else who would like to speak on this topic? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council. Council, um, we should talk about this too, and I, I do believe that all the information, especially answers Councillor Titus's question, which is valid. And for full disclosure, Councillor Titus is a trustee of the Auburn Water District, um, and I see what you're saying on that. Our interpretation, and Mr. Manager, please correct me if I'm wrong, my interpretation of this was this is a brick and mortar facility of a governmental use. Now, whether or not that includes um, water and sewer, because it's an infrastructure, I'm not sure, but I can't remember the last time Auburn Water or Auburn Sewer District, if you would, built a brick and mortar facility outside of maybe a pump house along a road. And yes, that would have to probably come back in front of us. Eric, Mr. Cousins, yeah. It would apply to some of those other, other government and utility facilities for brick and mortar construction, like you said. Um, it would apply to um, commu communications facilities, um, structures for providing utilities. It would not apply to if there's an existing sewer line that's being replaced. Um, that's just a maintenance or a replacement of a line in an existing location. Um, but new buildings in some of the zones where public utilities and municipal uses are listed as special exceptions, then it would trigger um, the additional review. Because they're listed as special exemptions? Correct. Any of them listed as permitted uses would not come to the Planning Board or Council. Um, permitted uses proposing structures over 5,000 square feet in area um, would typically become a special exception, even if they're listed as permitted, um, because of the size, and those would go to planning board, but those would not come to council. They okay. would just be the ones, you, the uses listed as a special exception that have the condition that requires the needs and impacts assessment to be approved by the council. Yeah, but the 15 by 15 pump house for Auburn water that's on Chicoin or Sunset, that would, that's, exempt if you would or if it's a replacement it absolutely is because that approval is already existing um, I can look very closely at that with staff tomorrow before planning board to make sure we are clear on whether or not a brand new pump station I'll use that example of 15 by 15 structure um, would or would not require council approval and, and, and council one of the things we're doing here and is just setting the stage to in our timeline is that we, we have recommendations or making motions to amend this now according to legal, which is again verified. We've done this a couple times before. We'll then look at our amended um, order or the amended order and then give us a recommendation on that. So if there is a motion to amend this and exempt utilities from this ordinance um, and leave it at planning board approval on special approval, then planning board would see that. 
Okay, so then again, if you're looking at this is still your ability now, and it's the perfect time to do so, is to make those motions to amend if you so wanted. I'll open this up to the council. Council? Comments, questions? Mr. Mayor, oh, um, I appreciate what Councilor Titus said, and I was looking at the language, which is fairly consistent throughout, and it says, uh, you know, under, for example, under public safety services, all projects shall provide a community impact and needs analysis with a review and approval from city council or its designee. Um, I share his concern about putting something else, another process with the city council, and my preference would be to just add that language for approval from the planning board. Just substitute planning board any place in the red redlined areas that says uh, city council or its designee. And that's sort of within their purview. As Eric pointed out in the uh, in the workshop, a lot of the, the issues are already considered by planning yeah. board. And this is just, I think the need part was what you were saying was something additional. That's really that's really the difference. The planning board's already looking at the impacts. They're just not required to look at the public need. Which is a city council purview, public need. Financial, like planning board, you've been on planning board. Yeah. Councilor Staples, they don't look at anything financial like you would tax revenue and so forth. Right, that's out of their purview. But any other comment? Discussion, debate? In the past, would you say, how many projects in the last five years would have been subject to this, or the last 10 years? Um, geez, it's been over 10 years, I guess. I mean, Auburn's move of PD to this building would have fallen into this category because it wasn't a public safety facility before that. Um, this building? Federal, this building. Um, although you also, as a council, would have had a role in deciding whether or not to fund both of those, so you would have been involved already. Uh, the federal and state government, in a lot of cases, are exempt um, from our local ordinances, but most of the projects at the Maine Army National Guard would be the most recent examples, choose to go through the review process as a community relations effort. Um, so, you know, they may not be required to at the federal level, but they, they may choose to anyways. Uh, we really haven't seen any significant new municipal or county level um, investments in brand new locations or facilities in the last 10 years. So it doesn't, this ordinance isn't going to cause a massive change in the way that we do business? I think where it's a little bit broader, as um, Andy Titus had pointed out, is that there are some zones where um, government uses require that approval by the council, and that looks like it would pull in some of those communication and public utilities facilities if they're governed by the PUC. So that's where it is a little bit broader, and you may see some additional. It might be time to entertain a motion to exempt I PUC government. And so, Council, you have you have a second reading. Um, I think Mr. Cousins stated that he would go back to his team and take a look at that. Um, I just wouldn't want to have to revise your uh, motion again if we were – because if you were to just say straight utilities, then that would be any brick and mortar. And so you might want that narrowly scoped. And okay. so I think staff could easily go through that, take a look, and then determine if that comes back to you or not. Um, so I'm not sure if I would uh, move forward with an amendment. You still have a second reading on that. If there's direction you want to give Eric to take back to the uh, planning board, you can do that. Yep. I, uh, I, I really tend to agree with Councilor Whiting on um, the idea about bringing these items to the city council is, is, a, is slightly problematic. Uh, the planning board has been specially trained to do site plan reviews. I understand there is a complication when you talk about a, a, a needs uh, community needs assessment. I guess I just, I, I have a hard time coupling the two and doing both at a council level. Could, could we potentially do just a needs assessment here? Uh, I, I wouldn't want to have to do a site plan review twice. Uh, you know, both at the, the planning board level and the 
council level. Am I reading it right? Is that the, what, what we're really ask, asking to do here? So it's not a full site plan review, but it would look specifically at the impacts to like noise, light, traffic, um, but not a full site plan review like setbacks and um, I guess access to utilities could be wrapped in. Uh, but the planning board is already looking at all of those things. So, you know, just looking at the needs might be, might be one option. I, I mean, I, I sat through a lot of site plan reviews on the planning board. They're quite lengthy presentations and, and there's a lot that goes into them. To go through that same level of, uh, you know, care and detail twice by two different boards, to me it doesn't, it, it's, it's duplicative. Um, I guess at this point, I'm not sure how we would read, how we'd make a motion to change this, but I, I think that the council could do a needs assessment. I, I'm okay with that. I just don't think that the, the site plan should be done at the city council level. You want to so, so you're suggesting that the multiple, that this is a different parts, because I do think that it's the city council's job to decide whether or not we want a facility that's a government agency. Yeah. In a, somewhere right so you're not disagreeing yeah. i just want to make sure that we're all so, on the same page yeah absolutely so a site plan review could be something like you should plant more trees in front of the entrance right. and, and we don't need to do that here no i agree with that we're policy though right i think i think with this information if we follow the city manager's recommendation too this is something that staff can look at um and looking at and we talked about it in the workshop you know having a period of time for staff to come up and planning board primarily staff, what that needs review is. So we can look at that when the time comes. So um, if you want, instead of doing a motion now, let's see what the planning board and staff come up with tomorrow and in the intervening time. Um, and then we can always look at that before Friday. Friday. And, and during the workshop, we discussed something to the effect of, I can't remember the wording, but it was something like the needs, uh, the needs assessment will be defined. With an X period of time. Yeah, 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 something like that. We could do something like that. We can. Yeah. So but again, we do it on we do it on the second read. Yeah. Okay. okay. That, that's fine. I, I mean, I, I think that there's a good plan here, and I, I appreciate the planning board's work on it. Uh, I just want it to be a little bit more specific on the on a yeah. couple of things. I think it's a great point. I don't think the city council needs countries. You know. So, any other comments? If not, I'm gonna ask for a roll call vote. Roll call vote, please. Councillor Hawes. Yes. Councillor Milks. Yes. Councillor Morin. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Councillor Staples. Yes. Councillor Gary. No. Councillor Whiting. No. Order passes. First reading, four two. Oh, I'm sorry, five two. Five two. I thought you were still absent. Next is order twenty three dash zero two one three two zero two three, authorizing city manager to execute a CBA, a collective bargaining agreement between the City of Auburn and the Auburn Firefighters Association, Local 797. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. second. A motion from Councillor Morin, uh, second from Councillor Whiting. Anybody in the public like to speak on this? None? I'll bring it back to the council. Council, is there any debate? Well, I appreciate our firefighters. I know we all do as well. Ask for a vote. Show of hands. All those in favor? Pass the 7-0. Next is the last open session of the night. I'll open this up to the public. Members of the public are invited to speak to the council about any issue directly, directly related to city business, which is not on tonight's agenda. If you'd like to speak, please step up to the podium and give us your name and address and limit your comments to three minutes. And sir, if you have any questions, please just come on up if you'd like to comment. Yeah, I'm, I'm, my name is Fred Stone. I live at 169 Royal River Road, Auburn. I'm not sure if I'm in the, right, in the right meeting or not, but I'd like to extend the, uh, I'm concerned about the ag zone, and I would like to extend some of my property right now into rural um, residential, because the line comes down both sides of the trap road and stops 100 feet from my property line. I'd like to extend that same zoning all down to include my property hmm. since they've changed they it was all ag zone at one time 
And now they, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, they came down both sides of the road, got to my property, and that still remains ag. I'd like to come down my property line. At some point, I'd like to build a house for myself. I have a big house now. It's too big for me. And I'd rather give that to my kids or something and build a smaller place and downsize. But I can't do anything. I mean, I've been paying taxes for 33 years there, and I, I haven't got anything back at all, and I can't do anything with it. So I'm either going to have to make some changes, or I'm going to have to move out of my house and sell the land. That's, I mean, I'm being, I feel like I'm being forced out of my house. Yep. That's what I feel like. So, uh, and another thing, I don't, this probably ain't the right place for this either, but there's a, there's a blue building down there on the trap road that is an eyesore, and it's a, a danger, it's a fire hazard, and uh, they, they come down and they boarded up the front of it last week over the doors that they ripped off, it's vandalized, they took all the copper pipe, the wiring, everything out of there. And it's just a, a hangout for people that want to do stuff, I don't know, vandalize things. And they tried to start it on fire and it didn't burn, so. So I guess they gave up, but I mean, it's just an eyesore, and they throw trash around there all the time. It belongs to a guy in Pennsylvania, and I'd like to know if something couldn't be done about that. Either tear it down or make the guy do something with it. It's been that way for years. So anyway, I guess I guess I gotta I guess I gotta go to the other side. No, you're good during the you, day. Fine. During the during the day, I and get. And get some more ammunition, uh, you know, a petition or whatever you got to get. I, I, I think. I, hold on, if I could. First of all, this is exactly what this open session is for. What you said, no problem. Second, I'd like you to get uh, your information out to the assistant city manager, Brian Wood, so we could follow up on both those items and then give you a schedule for when the planning board is going to start meeting to talk about agricultural and resource protection zone, um, and follow up with you on. And there are actions we could take as a city for that derelict property. So we want to make sure we keep you in the loop though. And uh, I have some other ideas too, but which I'll discuss later about that property. So. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, we appreciate that. Yeah. No, thank you, Mr. Stone. Thank Good you, you. Council. Yep. Okay. Anybody else in the public would like to speak? None being. We're gonna come on back down to reports. Mayor's report. Okay, big athletic week last week. Um, had basketball games. I was covered extensively. Last home game with Lewiston in the old gym. Um, they're going to love the new gym. So that is on track. That's a good segue. Um, but I'll cover that in just a second. Uh, boys, Alpine skiing. First place in KVAX. So they did outstanding. Girls, second place. Boys swimming as well. First place. Very, very good. There's probably some more. It's a very busy sports season. So if you do know of anything, please say, okay? Um, also, a lot of stuff going on here with Court Street, traffic. Went to a great meeting, actually. And I want to just tell the city manager, I appreciate the work that Chief Moen did, Jonathan Labonte in transportation, and Chris, our city engineer. I can't remember his last name. Um, hmm? Chris Bennett? Chris Bennett. Um, and about 40 to 50 residents that showed up. Um, it was very informative. We just didn't come with, you know, just asking. We came with really good, active measures based upon surveys that were extremely well populated, uh, great representation. So I think there's going to be some uh, marked improvement. It was good to hear from people uh, in the public that care about Court Street. We all know, we've talked about it. It is a big issue with all of us, too as a major arterial, so good to see that. Um, also, let's just like to bring up that it's legislative season. It's 2,300 bills. We're reviewing all of them. Um, it's a lot. There's a lot of bills that could have a direct positive and negative impact to Auburn. We'll keep you updated with memos, either for myself or the city manager. I'll be testifying in the legislature on March 3rd for the housing subcommittee uh, that's been formed try to give them some ideas, including permit-ready plans. So we've been, uh, we've been hustling along on that side. Uh, that's all I have to report. I'll turn start off here to the right. Anything? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's bittersweet 
I'm happy that a city tried to do some stuff for the, for the homeless to keep them out of the cold. I know our staff worked hard to try to get funding, but things didn't fall into place right. But so the, the, the bitter part of it is, are we going to have plans if we do get another sub-zero night? Are we going to come up with places where within our own city buildings to house people? I know Auburn Housing did it during the last one. I just don't want people out there that can't find a place after hours to freeze to death. One person is too much, and we've already had one. So I would like to see our city manager come up with some other places, even if it is the room in, across the way here. I'd volunteer to spend the night here and supervise or, or be there for anyone that wants to come in. Yep. Councilor Wadding? I'd just like to attest to Mr. Stone's uh, description of that property on Trap Road. The planning board was hearing about that 20 years ago, and I have no doubt that um, our good code enforcement people can, can deal with that. That's a problem property, has been for a long time, and it's because it's out of sight and out of mind, but he's a neighbor, so I'm glad he brought it to our attention. We at the sewer department are still looking for two trustees if anybody would like to get involved with their community the water the, the sewer trustee is a great way to get your foot wet into the getting involved with your community and it's once a month and we need more so we need two sewer trustees so if anybody would like to get involved we would love to have you I'd like to report that uh, uh, Mr. Stone resides within my ward, Ward 4 on Trap Road. I've actually spoken with him in length, uh, and I encouraged him to come here and speak in open comment uh, publicly about his needs and, his, uh, and the circumstances he's dealing with. So I've been doing a lot of investigating myself, a couple drive-bys, um, some looking, uh, taking, uh, making use of our excellent uh, GIS maps, um, and talking with some staff at the city to see what possible <coughs> pass forward there are for him to reconcile his concerns. I also agree there, Mr. Stone is uh, right on target with his property and with that old warehouse that's been standing down there causing problems for years. It's time that something's done. Uh, I don't know, you have to bubble, bubble wrap it, I guess, but it, something needs to be done down there. Uh, I'd like to just... Uh, let people know that the 6th Street Congregational Church will be holding its Neighborhood Watch meeting, and it's gonna be uh, our Auburn Police Department, as always, there, six o'clock on February 23rd. Now, what we've done is we've kind of grouped in the Police Academy for citizens of Auburn to come and learn about things that are going on. And we have a drug enforcement agent uh, come in on the 23rd at 6 o'clock to talk about drugs and the problems that are out there. In February 28th, the United New Auburn Association will have its meeting at Rowley's Diner, and we have the uh, fire chief, uh, Bob Chase, come in at 6 p.m. to talk about Auburn and I'm sure some safety uh, protocols. So please come and visit with us and uh, learn something. Uh, just want to report that the library committee met last uh, end of, I guess it was end of January, and we're discussing uh, what our fundraising is going to look like in this year, and we have hopefully exciting announcements to come on that. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Just a few things to report. Uh, first, a few have asked regarding the budget schedule. Uh, so I will provide to you at our next meeting, March 3rd, the budget schedule, CIP process, uh, what that will look like for you over the next uh, couple months. Uh, also, uh, regarding the warming center, um, so we were able to uh, partner with Auburn Housing uh, for space. 
And we were also able to partner with uh, the Immigrant Resource Center, uh, Fatuma Hussein and her team to provide the staffing uh, for the warming center. And uh, through the Community Development Block Grant uh, Office, uh, we were able to um, provide um, the security as well as um, the food and supplies that were necessary uh, for the 48-hour uh, warming center. Um, great job by the team, uh, the staff that worked to find uh, partners uh, to find a location uh, that was suitable and uh, to reach out to uh, some of our restaurant owners to um, to assist in that. Um, Autos uh, helped out with that. We also had um, the Cheesy Skillet helped out with that. So we had we had several restaurants that um, uh, that assisted. Da Vinci's helped out with that. So we had several that that participated in that. Um, total as far as um, the number count, if you were to total up the two number counts uh, for each day, I believe it was right around 20 individuals that had come in. Um, some stayed um, definitely overnight, some left first thing in the morning. Um, the other partner too was the YMCA. I think it's important to mention that we had, you know, within Auburn, uh, locations really challenging. So we had, we had that location but we had many that did not want to stay there throughout the day, so that transportation brought them back and actually allowed them to go back to the uh, uh, Pleasant Street uh, drop-in center. And so that was, that was a, a good use of the transportation um, so that they could come back and forth and also be more in the downtown for any other needs that they had. Um, as was mentioned, the uh, funding that we provided to the main housing, uh, we did have a long conversation with main housing. We were working with them back and forth regarding uh, the 121 Mill Street. Uh, 121 Mill Street is not, um, had not been permitted for uh, assembly um, for public use. And so uh, to get that to a point where uh, it was suitable under code uh, was going to take some time and the state had a very narrow scope on the, um, on the round of funding that we had applied for and that was you know, to try to get us through till April um, and be able to stand that up as soon as we could. Uh, so we did work with them. Um, but I think that uh, the other piece that's important uh, on this is that uh, part of that partnership with the uh, um, Immigrant Resource Center, is that the, that's the entity that will be providing the staffing at the Calvary Methodist Church in Lewiston. And so that was a good partnership. They provided their team that they have uh, because some of that team, there were that's an overnight shelter. And so they were able to come over and make some assistance. I think we'll continue to work towards um, addressing this issue. I'm glad that, I'm glad that Mr. Pelletier uh, mentioned uh, what he uh, mentioned. Uh, Council, you have put initiatives in place uh, through the um, Community and Business Development Office regarding uh, staffing through CDBG funds, our public health officer, uh, this is a, a focus of hers, especially as it addresses uh, the mental health component. Um, we also now have a homeless coordinator through that office. That's a position that's now within the city that we did not have before. Um, that is uh, boots on the ground. They're actually in the field. So when it came time to opening this warming center, um, this staff person, she went to everyone that was out panhandling several days prior to, once we knew the location, the times, handing out flyers, getting them the information, letting them know where to be for a pickup, um, and you really also then talking about other resources uh, that we could make available. Uh, this is the same team that works um, in collaboration with the Pleasant Street Drop-In Center um, regarding other uh, resources that might be available. So as a, as a, as a council, you, you are putting initiatives in place um, to try to help address this, this issue We'll continue to do so, um, and I think you'll continue to see. Uh, tonight was the public hearing regarding CBG and home funds, but that is a major portion of how we do address this and what we do to take care of it. So I think as we uh, continue to move forward in that process, it'll be important to weigh in and uh, make some policy decisions uh, relating to that. Um, that's all I have, Mayor. No, no thank you, thank you. Uh, Councilor Whiting. 
Thank you. Uh, the mayor reminded me I missed an opportunity to uh, discuss uh, the new name of uh, Museum LA. It's now Maine Mill, uh, Maine Museum of Innovation, uh, Learning, and Labor. And they have a new exhibit, uh, and uh, they're fundraising for a new site, and they are well on their way to uh, a building in the old, I think it's Camden Yarns, Yarns building mm -hmm. uh, down along the riverfront. So yep. thanks for the reminder. Yeah. Um, okay, very good. On to finance, uh, the finance report, January finance report. Ms. Eastman, we have your memo. We read it. Is there anything you'd like to highlight? Not at, not at this time. Um, there was nothing that really stood out to me. I have got a question just based upon precedent. Um, audit results. How are we looking for that? They just finished pretty much, well, they, they were here in January to yeah. do the field work. Um, and then when they left, they were still doing field work, basically. Um, they have some new people, so they're in training. And You're training um, them well? Yes, <laughs> trying. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so um, it took a little longer this year than, you know, uh, normal because, it, because they were new and we're a very complicated city, so um, we have a lot of different types of funds and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was it was a bit of a training process for these kids, but um, they're coming along, and we should be getting the report, you know, fairly soon. The draft report. Um, I we're going to be fine. We'll be in a good place at the end of that audit. So the audit within thirty, sixty days, ninety. Um, the results. I, I believe we'll have it by the m middle of March. Okay, great, okay. thank you. Yep. Is there any other, uh, excuse me, any other questions for Jill at this time? Or Kelsey, finance? None being? Sure, I got one. Oh, um, I'm sorry, didn't see you, Dana. I've been meaning to ask this for a while. So when you're doing your, your finance reports, uh, how, how do they directly impact the, the proposed budget for the next year? I, I, I assume that you and the, the city manager will talk about different things and you, you would probably report on things as they're running and what the increases might be next year. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, we have those conversations probably <laughs> monthly. Um, we go over this and, you know, because we meet every, every month. So um, we're always talking <laughs> about where we are or what we need to do. So definitely. I appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you. Council, I'll just say that we, we also make adjustments. So we don't wait for um, issues to become crises. We, we, we'll address it. If we're seeing some shifting, we'll then start talking with department directors, taking a look at what's going on within their budget. We typically know because we meet regularly with the department directors, but we know what's going on, especially if it's a staffing challenge or other impacts. But, um, but we will call an audible. We'll. Uh, Day after Super Bowl, I should have to make at least one reference, but we'll call an audible sometimes, and we will make adjustments as necessary. I'd like to compliment the finance department for uh, getting good interest rates. Mm -hmm. I saw that, and it, it just sort of gave me a little kick reminder yeah. that you know, hey, the banks' rates are going up, and the city's taking advantage. So, good job. Yeah, thank you. I will entertain a motion to accept the place on file of the January 2023 finance report. Do I motion, motion to accept. Second. Councilor Walker, second for Councilor Moore, and all those in favor? Right, okay, 7 0. Uh, next, uh, we got some executive sessions. Uh, labor negotiations. Uh, this is police patrol pursuant to 1 MRSA section 405. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Councilor Haas, Councilor second. Milks on the second. All those in favor? We now stand in executive session, and we have no further action after executive session other than adjournment. So thank you all very much, and have a great night. Yeah, we'll take a three-minute pause.